Thank you for coming out, those of you who came out on your own volition and those of you who didn't. <laughs> um, uh, it's, a, it's great to see, see all of you here. My name is Adam Braver, um, and this is the, the second in the um, Talking in the Library, of, uh, the second event in, the, in this fall Talking in the Library series. Um, we have one more, which will be on November 17th. Uh, it will be very interesting, of course, Many people will, will be, the same people will be here, um, but for the rest of you who, who may not, weren't planning on it, we'll be having um, a man named Semahine Abebe, who is an Ethiopian, former Ethiopian prosecutor and law professor who was exiled from Ethiopia for um, things he said, in the, you know, for teaching in the classroom, for teaching law in the classroom. Um, and is now, um, since through, uh, through the organization Scholars at Risk, been placed at the University of Connecticut, um, where he is a fellow in their Human Rights Center. Um, so very interesting, very interesting man, very interesting story, um, and, uh, and very engaging. Um, but um, this evening, this afternoon, um, we have Aaron X. Smithers um, with us here today. Um, sh um, um, Dean Isinger will be um, hosting and moderating, so I will get off this microphone in just a moment. Uh, I, I will only say that I met Aaron this summer um, when I um, was volunteering or volunteered to volunteer um, at the Jazz Festival, at the Newport Jazz Festival, and I got volunteered to check credentials of photographers as they came into the pit, which was a little, you know, like being a, a bouncer. Um, and, um, and Aaron was um, front and fore Front, you know, the front row at, at all times to take pictures, and, and we would get to chatting. And I found Aaron's story. I found Aaron and the story she was telling so interesting, um, partially from her past, um, growing up in, in China and coming here, um, and her passion for jazz and how those two intersected, which um, which we'll hear about today. So, Aaron X. Smithers, Dean Rob Isinger. Aaron, why don't, why don't we have you up here? Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I too had the pleasure of chatting with Aaron as well. Uh, there's something kind of passionate and intoxicating about a conversation with her where, uh, if you don't already know, I too have a, a passion for jazz, but it didn't take long where we started to talk about jazz and photography and writing and how they all intersect. So what we're going to do is I'm gonna lead Aaron with a few questions from which Aaron is likely to kind of expand on them and uh, you know, answer appropriately and accordingly. Uh, no doubt we'll make sure that there's some time for questions and answers from you. And I'm also wondering, given the, given the photography, whether we want to keep the lights just as they are, or if we want somehow to dim them, we can do that later. Uh, but for now, why don't we get the ball rolling with kind of the first question, and it's the first one that came to mind when there was this topic of jazz and photography and writing, and I say many students don't know what jazz is, or when they think of jazz, they think of music that's noisy or cacophonous. I'm not looking for a perfect definition of jazz, but what does jazz mean to you? You mentioned as well that your late father introduced you to jazz. Can you please tell us something about that and his concept of jazz? First, I want to say thank you so much for having me here. It's truly an honor um, to continue that story with Adam. It was very interesting, actually, at the, um, Newport Jazz that I thought this guy looked familiar. Of course, later I realized that he was the author that had read you know, the books that has published, but I didn't want to ask. And it was at one of the spiritual moments that I always felt that what I call, when you're in such good music, in the African-American sense that they say that you're at church. So jazz, to me, have many, many different meanings. My late father used to say that um, he would joke about that jazz is life. The concept of jazz is life. That there are many rules to good jazz music. And what exactly jazz is to me. I think in so many ways that when I think about that, this would be the 19th year that I am here. I came from China. I grew up uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Um, if you're not familiar, you can Google that. And uh, at the meantime, that um, 
what I found was that I had two tremendous mentors. I grew up with my grandmother, who came from a really wealthy family, but um, the new China had taken every single of their belongings away um, to sort of making an equal sense in some ways for rest of the population. That's what she told me. And uh, from her, I have learned that there is so much joy in learning. There's a spirit that it carries on. Um, many of her teachings, I find that I carry them on today. But what she believed actually was very interesting was that it paralleled from my father's teaching, which was the concept of jazz. My grandmother believed that there is a joyfulness in everything that we do and we are despite the fact that she was sent to the countryside to be re-educated as the person that who was privileged. To many people that they would have found that harsh. She was put on the stage, she was forced to do many um, bitterly labors that she's never done before, but from that she taught me that there is this tremendous joy in everything to learn how to use your hands, to find great beauty even through decay and sorrow, and to be able to make a choice in life that despite the fact that life happens, that he, the family itself were put in tremendous, under tremendous pressure. Um, but at the meantime that I was told and I was taught to find many, many of those happiness in the things that she was able to do. I remember that she used to tell me that um, how she has never learned to um, walk in the rice field, to pick out leeches on her legs, you know, to be able to sew, to knit. She taught me all of that, the joy of cooking. And at the meantime, there were no music and there were no books for over 10 years. Later, my father was the one who introduced me to jazz. That um, I always knew my father loved jazz, but to me, just like um, Robert said, that it sounded like noise to me. He asked me. But my father once told me that it's because you didn't know the story of what exactly jazz was. He often said that jazz is about a language, a language of triumph, struggle, Freedom, democracy, conversations, love, and trust, and respect. So to me, jazz is above many, many of these things. Today, I find myself taking pictures behind the Newport Jazz Festival, standing next to George Wayne, chatting with Fred Taylor, who have taped Dave Brubeck in a two-inch tape recorder that was used later in Columbia record. All of these things, it's the connection to life. It's my father's concept of jazz is that there is, there is the band, there's the leader. But at the meantime, when you're supposed to come in, when you're supposed to exit, what exactly is the timing? And how much respect you should have. And how much you should know your craft. To master what you know. And to let what you love to do and become who you are. So to me, even as a parent, a single parent, I find that all of these language, of my father's language of jazz, that reflect, reflect in every single thing that I do and I am. There are many types of jazz. Uh, which types do you prefer and from what era? Which musicians and why? And what kinds of jazz do you find unappealing? And I realize that I just asked you seven questions. <laughs> well, um, So if you want me to repeat them, I gladly will. But let's, what kind of jazz do you, sure. you prefer? I call myself old school. I think I love that name, Old School. I always say that um, 
my, my father, my grandmother taught me that there are things you only live once. You have to live this urgency. You have to be a service. Not just to others first, but to yourself. Because if it's not being a service to yourself, you can't be a servant to others. So to me, I find the so-called old schoolness, it means that you do the right things, you be the righteous person. So to me, I like old school jazz. It's in 1950s era to the 60s. I listen to all sorts of music and spoken word artists and all of that. I am interested about stuff that cross the genre, that something real, something that have substance, something that have stories to tell. Because I really believe that we're all here to tell stories. Who we know, what we do, and everything and every single day. It's this little service that we actually have to contribute to the world. As before I get, a, get to ask one of those questions again, I, I'm kind of intrigued. I want to push you when you say old school and you mentioned 50s and 60s. To some jazz musicians, old school is 20s and 30s. So tell me a little bit about, name a couple of musicians that you were on a desert island, you have that opportunity, now we'll call it an MP3 instead of the desert island disc, yep. or the desert island album. You have to have that LP with you. Mm. Name two or three. And we're, I'm gonna ask you the same question about photography too. So sure. that's coming, I'm hinting. Um, there are few albums that I carry not in my iPod, which I have five. And, but in real album, I carry the A Love Supreme, This Me, along with the book, um, the story about the Love Supreme, all the time. There's something about that album that has the story of becoming, the enlightenment that inspires me all the time. It's not because it's a famous album. I think going back to the story that you know, my father was the one actually introduced me to jazz and through the music of John Coltrane, Alabama, civil rights movement, the struggle, the African-American struggle. Years later, I met Stanley Nelson at WGBH. Mm -hmm. um, he, the first question he asked me was that, um, where do you go to church? After he heard about the story of my father and jazz and all of these things and my interest about civil rights movement and freedom writers and all of this. I said, um, I don't go to church. I'm a Quaker. I go to a Quaker meeting. He said, see, everything that you do has something going back to what you heard. Even today, when we're connecting all of this, I find myself that connecting dots in my past life that everything made sense. It all made perfect sense. I always say that I have many, many different playlists. On the rainy days, I like to listen to Monk. Because there is this Drizzle, drizzleness in his music that make you want to tap your feet and get up and just or do nothing. There's something about him that I always remember. There were some footages from Denmark that people thought that he was crazy. <laughs> and on Sundays, I always like to listen to um, Hank Jones and Charlie Hayden. And on the days that are very light and breezy, I listen to things that whatever that come to my mind. But it's because of that era I find that they have so much story to tell. And if I felt stormy inside, and I would listen to something that normally it's not typical my choice, but then I find something that I didn't know, I didn't hear a long time ago. Every single time, when I hear Come Sunday,
there's something so special about that. And Duke Ellington, he's good for any single day. I, I would uh, suggest for those in the audience, if you want to have fun after this talk, uh, enjoy and take Aaron up on YouTubing Duke Ellington and type in a Lotus Blossom Duke Ellington. Lotus Blossom is a song written by Billy Strayhorn. Uh, and there's on YouTube a version of Duke Ellington performing it, which was apparently something that Duke liked, liked to do to close his show. And there's one of those famous closes, like here's something that Billy wrote. I hope you like it. And it's that elegant Duke Ellington playing the piano like he is Chopin, playing a tune that can make you cry just listening to it, and it makes you wonder uh, this should be mandatory viewing at every college and university. So with that, what about, and again, it's a little, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. In a, what about, what don't you like? Or what do you find? You just said you, you find something that you learn even those, in those things that you don't normally appreciate. But it kind of like saying jazz, I can listen to all of it. It's kind of like saying classical music, I can listen to all of it. Some of it I find completely unlistenable. What about yourself? I'm going to push you. What do you, what do you not find all that appealing? Well, and why? I have a standard that time is very limited, at least for me. I work full time. I freelance full time. I write a jazz blog. I'm a single parent. My son is in college. I have many, many excuses. And my son normally jokes about that. If you have a lot of money, you're going to have a lot of free time. I know it would not be me. Because I like to read five books all at once. I listen to everything coming in front of me. And I like to be inspired. And I'm curious as a cat. I can't stop thinking that one day when my children both go into college that I will go back to school as my dream. So for that being said, time is something that's very, very precious to me. And there's a quality of music that it's not just about the music. It's not just that you have a strong rhythm section, that you know how to riff it off. That sometimes I see a lot of young musicians. They believe that they're coming of age. I see talents. I don't see stories. I don't see the essence. Why, why they perform? Why they wrote that piece? What was the connection to them between that, between that piece to life? So for that being said, sometimes I would test out new music. I would make an effort to see something that maybe normally I'm not, it's not my choice to go see, especially in live gigs. But it would not be my second choice if someone doesn't behave in some ways. When I see that, it's, I can't stand when people are full of themselves in some ways that during the performance or during their interviews that they would start to bash about someone else, bash about what they're not. And for that, sometimes I would actually, it would turn me off. I would try to make an effort later to go back to them again and to see that if there is anything more. But to me, what's connect to the music in so many ways, it's the stories behind the music and how was that music made and how was that coming from. And to me, jazz is always about respect and trust. And without that, there would be no jazz today. There are many photographers mm -hmm. who find themselves intrigued by jazz musicians, who find themselves drawn to jazz, and Milt Hinton, among others, one of the more famous jazz musicians, who found himself drawn to photography. And I recall last summer I was at the Yale Museum, and sure enough, it's a Milt Hinton exhibition of his photo photographs. Tell us a little bit about the connection between your passion for jazz and the visual, and especially the photograph. Sure. Um... When I take pictures, I tell my children the same way. Actually, on that paper that you saw a headshot of me, my daughter took that picture. And it was a simple picture. And, but there's so much 
It shows about me. It shows the essence of me, that it's real. And to me, that's why I take pictures. It's not about my skills, my after editing, that how I can manipulate the image. There will be a set of pictures that when we hear a, a piece of sound that um, um, later that I will show you the set, they're actually not edited at all. There was something wrong with my PC last night and I couldn't. But from that, last weekend my son sent me a picture. He asked me to title it. He, took, he takes pictures with his iPhone. And once in a while he sent me a picture and I would title it. Last week he sent me this beautiful picture of a quiet street in Georgetown. He asked me, what was that? I said, take five. And he goes, mom, that's what I thought about too. So I think when I think about, when I'm in nature, I'm in total silence. There's no music, but you can hear music. You can hear different parts of music from an image like that. There will be pictures of my children. Let's see. I'll show you here. So in some ways, this is the Omar Tom. Can we dim the lights just a little bit? I think we can figure out where and how, just a little bit. We don't have to go black, but I think they'll be even sharper. These pic that's a picture from Berkeley Jazz Festival were they, were they a couple weeks ago. That, is that this, is his, this is his debut piece in front of thousands of people about LGBT. And he's dressed so sharply. I wish I could show more of this. He was wearing a wooden tie. He's gay himself. And this image, his dignity and his character and the love he has for big band and for jazz and for who he is, it shows. It's not about me, it's his story. I just happen to be so fortunate enough to be so close, right there. This was a picture from this past summer at the International Art Festival. It was an ocean of people. I was on the stage, and you could feel the love that was so strong that I literally don't want to take pictures, but I was working. <laughs> this is not a very focused picture, but it's darling, darling to my heart. This is my son, Henry. James. This was doing Nemo. I don't know if you remember the, one of the biggest storms. We want to take a walk in the midst of the storm and there was a group of geese and swan and ducks that they followed him and they started talking to him and asking for food. Thank you. And it's that moment. For me, my daughter always goes that that's what's called in a sentimental mood. Brian Blade, he came to Columbus to record a new album in Providence. The joy, the love that he has. He doesn't just play jazz music. He played with Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, you name it. He was just on tour with Wayne Shorter. This is one of the images that wasn't what the parents requested, but I saw the becoming of the little girl in sunset. Most of my friends call this the tree of love, tree of life. To me, it's a love supreme at any given day. It can certainly become Sunday. On that day, it was one of the coldest days. I snapped two pictures without focus, without thinking about anything else. I made him the wreath because he wanted one since his sister had one that I made with roses. And I asked him, to hold on to this one little thought that what would he want for Christmas? He 
he looked at me. Mark Morris, the dance company that came to Providence a couple years ago. My son Henry, the day before we dropped him off to Georgetown. There's so many things about this picture that I felt that there is, there is my, there was my hope for him that he will always be grounded. You know that song, Forever Young from Bob Dylan? The lyrics, that's my hope. Ron Carter, the man of grace. You even need to hear the music. You can feel it. My daughter. Her name's Lian. It actually means lotus. Years ago, when I was listening to one of Duke Ellington's pieces, that she jumped into the room. This was maybe she was five. She came in and she says, Mom, Mom, I know that piece. That's Duke. I know that's Duke. <laughs> I said, what do you mean that's Duke? She said, I learned that from school. And it's a public school. <laughs> this, this piece, I took my daughter for a little photo trip. I told her about contradictions. It's in darkness that we long for the light. And you can think about the piece of music that maybe it's remind you of. I won't tell you mine. Most of my photographs are actually interesting enough. They're titled after jazz pieces. This is Beavertail, one of, the, one of the most beautiful places in Rhode Island that you can go see the sunset. Well, where to begin? Uh, so clearly you can take a picture. Uh, where did you develop this photographic skill? And why do you name your photographs after jazz pieces? I mean, granted, do you have to search for the song? But first, let's talk about your, your photographic acumen and where and how it was cultivated. we're all here once again to tell stories. I am a storyteller. If you have, if you're interested about the jazz blog that I'm writing with Eric Jackson, who is a jazz host in WGBH, I'm interested about people's story, where the music came from. And even in nature, there's so many things that it reminds you that despite the fact, there's something about sunset that despite the fact that anything happens, there's a beautiful sunset, there's guaranteed a gorgeous next day. Taking pictures about to be in that present moment, to let go of everything else, and to capture, and to tell the story for the nature, and to capture that mood that you were in and who you were with, and to keep that time Frozen. I used to take pictures with a large format when I was in China. I had a dark room and I used to write different columns. And I think one thing that I was always interested about was, once again, the old school black and white photographs that on the street, kids are playing, people coming out of church. There's a conflict. There's words and stories coming out of the images without being titled. Some of the, some of the pictures from the Great Depression, pictures from the nature, parenting. And we're here to tell stories. I'm certainly, sometimes I would go through an interview when people ask me, can you do this? I would say, I don't think I'm the one you're looking for. I don't, if you want me to, make you look like somebody else. I can't, that's not what I do. But at the meantime, 
There is so much joy in this life. No matter, either it's in the great beauty or in the great decay. There's so much to learn. And for that, I take pictures and I listen to music. So let's transition about writing. Because uh, in many ways, some people might think that writing is the anti-jazz, only in the sense that there's a lot of structure and there's punctuation and there's paragraphs and there's a right and a wrong and there's a yes and a no. Now, we know jazz has rights and wrongs and yeses and nos, but writing in almost any narrative has a kind of format that it doesn't always lend itself to free writing. Talk about blogging and writing and where that's come from and how it also informs your photography and how it informs your listening and how the three intersect, the writing, the photographs, and the music listening. Sure. Um, I don't actually review music. When we started the jazz blog, Eric and I, we had many, many conversations. And we meet a lot of musicians and we actually attend a lot of things together. Um, what we want to be, we're the one that, who are the music lovers, who are the jazz lovers, who are the African Americans in some ways that we are, we are the messengers. We're not here to judge. I love to reading reviews about what other people's in, interpretation of somebody else's album. But at the meantime, I want to hear it on my own. And when I write about jazz-related things on our blog, it's about the stories, about why certain music they came from. For example, there was this one story about Kyle. And he went to Harvard. He was about to graduate from Harvard for economics and go into Wall Street. And in the midst of that, he met Hank Jones, a group of them after a uh, master workshop, and they took the master out for dinner. And they decided that they should go on for more jam session after that. And Mr. Hank Jones said, no, I can't. This was past midnight. He says, I have to go back. I have to practice. I have to put my practice time in. This is one of the greatest jazz masters. That had a huge impact on Kyle. After he graduated from Harvard, he went and got a scholarship to Berkeley. And now he lives in New York, struggling as a jazz musician. But his brand new album, you can't hear all the guts. You can't hear all the struggles, but you can also hear this great joy for what he came through. So I think for that, I want to tell that story. I've written about a Turkish composer. He, in, he was a, a, I think he still is a, a fellow at Harvard, teaches at, at New England Conservatory. He sort of, in some ways, in his own words, that ditched the traditional Turkish music when he came to America. He wanted to, he was very, very curious about big band music and films and everything else. And after many years in America, now he's going back to retrieve his Turkish roots. His last album, it's as gorgeous as it could be. Some of the pieces that reminds me of my favorite films from Wes Anderson. And I think because of that, I write. And at the main time, I also take pictures of them. And so all of that becomes. Are there particular photographers that you believe help inform writers and writings or help listeners to certain types of music. So in addition to kind of thinking through about the jazz, I'm wondering, any, any we, we have advice for future bloggers and writers. What about advice for future photographers? I don't actually have any suggestion for that. <laughs> <laughs> Stay curious. 
for me that I think everyone should go back and look at those old Italian black and white photographs. There was this documentary um, about the, what's her name, that she's the old, I have a hard time with names. That's one thing coming from the foreigner territory. And uh, um, uh, something Meyer. She was an old babysitter. I Vivian Meyer. Vivian Meyer. I've seen that documentary three times at Cable Car. And uh, um, she had a hidden camera that she used to take selfies of herself. And she took many, many pictures. She's one of my fav new favorites that I constantly find myself going back, looking at her pictures and thinking, what was she thinking? What did she see? How did she feel? In those the pictures that it tells, you know there's an expression called certain pictures that it explains more than 10,000 words. I believe some of her pictures Let's, before, I know you want to share a song with us, but before you do that, let's go back to the intersection of your photography. Uh, one senses that you might have a passion, if not an obsession, with picture taking and jazz. Would you describe it as such? And if not, why not? I would not call it obsession at all. I find strangely enough that sometimes I tell people that I wish I don't have to take pictures because now that I have to document things because of the blog, also as a photographer, that there, there are times that you are so moved, you don't want to be interrupted. You want to keep that going. Yeah, but most of the time, I have to work. We're easier for documenting reasons than for a blog. I definitely find that there is also the concept of jazz that from my father that it reflects of what I do. I believe that you must know your boundaries. You must know that when you should come in and when you should not. You should leave the musicians in a respectful distance. If you can't be good at what you do, from a certain distance, without interrupting the music, and let that be. If you don't get a good image, let that be. Don't interrupt music. Be respectful. It's not about you. Taking pictures, it's not about you. How the picture look, it's not about you. It's about how the story is going to be told. So to me, for example, last night, I went to a recital at Berkeley. A really dear friend then who's about to graduate this year. I took very, very little pictures. I took the pictures for his mom. Sri Tang's mom, is, his parents, is in India. I go to all his recitals, and I took maybe 10 pictures. It was a beautiful performance. I sat there. I was so moved for all the music choices, for all the, the musicians that they came together. They were two bands that they came together. And for him, as a senior, rather than showing off his own music, he let everybody else play. I think in some ways there's something about the Asian culture, that how John Coltrane was inspired from Eastern philosophy. It reminded me a lot of that from last night. And I, I'm so glad that I didn't take the pictures. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, would you like to kind of almost conclude before we do Q&A with, with a song and perhaps a slideshow or something you have in mind? My children, that they always say that they're not a fan of jazz, but they actually listen. I truly believe that because of the great mentorship that I had from my grand grandmother and my father, I was adopted, by the way, I was so loved. 
I believe that there is this urgency in life. We need to be mentored. We need to mentor others. And with my children, and with everything that we do, we need to continue to speak, to have the conversation going. I talk to my children about jazz all the time. This particular day, I was talking to my daughter when she asked me, why are you listening to that one song in repeat? Mm -hmm. I said, because I have to listen to each instrument five times. Then I go to the next one and listen to the second instrument on that piece. And I started to ask her what did she think about this piece, which was titled New Song from Laszlo Gardoni, who is a Boston-based jazz musician who came from Hungary. I think a lot of the music that it made so much sense to me that I'm sharing with you today is that it reflects of who I am. He too is a foreigner. He too loved jazz and gospel music, the old spirituals. And during this, this was recorded at Berkeley School of Music in a, during a live performance. My daughter heard what she called the ebbs and flows of life. In the nutshell, there's a chaotic, there's three horns, two saxophones, and one bass clarinet. There's gracefulness. There's danger. There's boundaries. There's conversations. And there's so much love and respect that when you hear Sometimes the silence dropped. Other instruments come in. They talk through their soul and their, their heart. None of this can be explained in so many ways. You've got to go see the live gigs of jazz because each single time is different. I've seen them so many times. I would not stop seeing them. By the way, my daughter, who said she is not a jazz fan, she wanted to know that there's the understanding of this piece. And I told my daughter, Leanne, I said, listen, I can ask Laszlo. I'm sure that what your interpretation of life, of this becoming of life, becoming this person that every single one of us is represented in that song, that it would parallel, it would parallel this what his interpretation of this composition. And indeed, it was. He talked about that this was in the 4-4 signature, a tribute to Western African-American music. And at the meantime, throughout all the chaos, there's harmony. So take it. We have time for some questions, so it sounds like I see one in the front, one in the back, and then we're going to mandate students ask questions, <laughs> or else no one leaves. Go, oh, you first. When I think of jazz and photography, mm -hmm. there's one person that emerges as the greatest, and that's Roy D. Carava. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I've seen his work. Yes. And he lived both, both lives and identified really by his visual I can't remember the name, but yeah, there's a, he's one of the legendary jazz artists that I have taken pictures that I always believe that, especially the, this picture about Eric Dolby, there's so much intensity about who he was, what his music meant to him. So once again, it's about the story, it's about the person, it's not about the photograph, but the photographer, not our Um, 
uh, I have a, uh, a comment and a question. My comment is that um, as a writer, I find that um, writing uh, has its own, uh, almost, a, you, you can have your own rhythm, and so, so it's almost like music sure. at times. So, so that, my, my question really is, is how, do, how were you exposed to jazz when you were still in China? Um, did your family have a, an album collection? Did you sneak out at night and meet somebody on the corner and exchange tapes and records? Uh, was it broadcast on a radio? How did you uh, get, get to uh, listen to, to jazz while you were there? Well, um, there were no music for a long, long time, only until the early 1980s. Um, my uncle was able to go to Japan first, and he brought back a lot of the, the, the vinyls for my father, who everyone knew that and played all the horns, made recorders and played the sitar and all of this, you know, he, he was, my father was, um, they were, they belonged to the Northeast, um, Northwest of China, so it was border of Russia. So there are a lot of Middle Eastern influences, but there's also influences from India, Nepal. So there's a big mix of that. And this, what he did, that he's a, the years that when China was finally open, he would um, go visit certain, um, he was a superintendent of the school system, so he would build horseback schools and he would teach children how to play. There's all the jazz albums that my uncle brought back to him, but I was never interested about what those records were. I just thought they, they, they sounded very noisy, very chaotic, <laughs> unorganized. I had no idea what they meant. Uh, until one day that he asked me, I asked him that, you know, why do you like this? This just it doesn't even make a lot of sense. Uh, he asked me to listen to a piece, and that happened to be um, Alabama. And he asked me what I heard. Um, he asked me to tell him. By the way, I do that with my children. That's what I did with my daughter of that particular song. That she called that song Becoming without knowing the song was titled New Song. Um, so I told him about what I heard. All of the things that we know about Alabama and the history of that. And that opened the door to the jazz music to me. And he started telling me a lot of things about struggle, about in so many ways that the language of jazz is a, is a universal language. Music by itself, they call that in different genres. It's a concept. It's how you make the connections to the music. Once they start to make sense to you, the music becomes dominant to you. And that's all that is. So don't give up on things that because you think that you may have no interest about it. But if you actually get to know why the music was made, it would start to make sense. And jazz is definitely a good way to start. Questions from us, here we go. So do you only listen to jazz or have you ever tried to take up playing an instrument yourself? Um, I used to play the cello when I was very little, but because I was grow up, I, I, it was during the Cultural Revolution, and that was taken away as well. Um, it's a long story, but, so I had to give up the music. My grandmother was secretly teaching me that I had to stop. For new music, no music could be heard. No sound, even when you practice without sound. But that, uh, there is a great film that called, uh, um, about two, talking about the repression of music and of culture um, in Africa. And it's a beautiful film. If you love music, you've got to see that film. Um, I listen to all sorts of music. I actually, I'm a huge fan of uh, indie music. So I go to the Newport Jazz and uh, Newport Folk Festival every year as well. Providence has a huge um, population that and uh, talented musicians everywhere. What people don't understand is that a lot of things, they interconnect. We all interconnect with something we know, we love. Someone else that you love, know. And so in that, for example, I love Of Monsters and Men. 
a couple of weeks ago, I was at the live concert. Um, my friend Pat actually took me to that concert. Um, Christopher Paul Sterling. It was extremely emotive. He's a very, very charged musician like he performs. And there were a couple pieces that when he, when he was on stage, I was in tears. I, I felt the tears, the invisible tears, flowing through me. And it was not jazz. It's a mix of things, folk. I love blues. I love music that it, it has so much to tell. Like, one of my favorite albums is um, Ray Cooter, um, Meeting by the River. He met the Indian musician, two of them, that one hour before the recording. If you hear that album, you won't believe. You probably think that they have had this kinship throughout their life. No, they didn't. That's how beautiful that album is. So as we wrap up an hour uh, for the students, that's John Coltrane, Alabama. John Coltrane, a love supreme. Duke Ellington, Lotus Blossom. You have your listening list now. You know what your homework is. Uh, please join me in thanking Aaron X. Smith.